So, you've mastered the basics of coding in Julia, and you're ready to kick it up a notch. You've heard that Julia is fast, but how fast can you accelerate your code? And what tools are available in Julia to help you ramp up your speed? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Donka.jl, where I explore the vast Julia wilderness and turn my discoveries into wholesome Julia tutorials. For today's tutorial, I will be using the Julia documentation on performance tips and profiling as a reference. The links to these sections are provided in the description below. We'll learn how to use the performance tools that come included with Julia, like the at time macro and the profiler. By the end of this tutorial, you'll know what resources are available to help you turn your average Julia code into high performance Julia code. This tutorial is intended for intermediate users of the Julia programming language. So I'm assuming that you know the basics of how to write code using Julia and that you're comfortable using Julia in VS Code. For this tutorial, I will be using Julia version 1.8.5 and using VS Code along with the Julia extension for VS Code. For the record, I'm using a desktop computer running Windows 11, and my CPU is the Intel i9-10900K with a base clock speed of 3.7 GHz. Your results will be different depending on your setup. With that said, let's get started. As a motivating example, we're going to use AXB. AXB stands for A times X plus Y, where A is a scalar and X and Y are vectors. This is a common equation that's used in many different subjects like linear algebra and machine learning. We're going to start with some naive code that one might write when first learning a programming language. And then we'll iterate over this code several times to see how fast we can get XB to run in Julia. In VS Code, I'm going to create a new file named axb1.jl, but feel free to name your files whatever you like. Let's start by defining some variables. N is the number of elements or the vectors X and Y. I'm using a value of 100 million, which will give us a couple of large vectors. The scalar A can be any value. Just for fun, let's use an estimated value of Euler's number. For the vectors X and Y, I'm going to use random numbers. I'm using a random seed, so I can use the same random numbers in future iterations. For the result, let's set up an empty array named Z. In order to fill this empty array, let's use a for loop to perform the calculation element by element, and then push the result into the array. At the same time, let's use the at time macro to time how long this takes. The first time we use the at time macro, Julia will need to compile the macro. The same goes for any function that we call, like the push bang function. So on my computer, this took over 30 seconds to run, so I edited this recording. Let's create a text file so we can keep track of the outputs from the at time macro. You can just copy and paste the output from the REPL into the text file. We'll discuss what all of these numbers mean in a few minutes, but for now, let's run our code a couple of more times. Our code didn't actually return the values of the vector z, so if you want to see it, just type in z. Now, in order to run our code a second time, we need to clear the vector z. Now, we can run our timer again. You can just copy and paste this code. Again, let's copy and paste the output from the at time macro into our text file. Let's take a look at Z again. Let's run our code one more time. Don't forget to clear Z before timing your code. 
And let's copy and paste the output from the at time macro into our text file. Okay, let's talk about these three outputs. The at time macro provides a lot of good information, but it does take some deciphering to understand it. The time in seconds is pretty self explanatory. That's the overall time that it took your computer to run your code. But what are allocations, GC time, and compilation time? Allocations means memory allocations, which includes both account as well as the size of those memory allocations. In this example, there were 700 million allocations, which added up to 12.9 gigabytes of memory. GC time means garbage collection time which is shown as a percent of the total time. Garbage collection is the term for computer memory management. The garbage collector will run periodically to clear out some memory that you allocated but are no longer using. In this example, roughly 50% of the time was spent quote unquote, collecting garbage. Compilation time is the time that it takes to compile any code the first time that it's called which is shown as a percent of the total time. As you can see, the compilation time only shows up in the first run. In this example, the compilation time percentage is relatively small compared to the overall time. So these are the times to beat. Are these times good or bad? Well, we won't know until we tweak the code to see what happens. For the next iteration, let's wrap our code inside of a function. Before running the next iteration, close out of the Julia session and create a new file. For this iteration, we're going to use the same variables for n, a, x, and y. So you can just copy and paste the definition for those variables from the previous file. For the vector z and for the for loop, let's place that code inside of a function that takes the arguments a, x, and y, and then returns the value of z. Now we can use the at time macro and simply call the function. Like before, let's copy and paste the output from the at time macro into our text file. Wow, that's a big difference in time. All we did was wrap some of the code inside of a function, but the code itself is essentially the same. Also, notice that the number of memory allocations is down, as well as the size of those memory allocations. But the garbage collection time percent is roughly the same, and the compilation time percent is a little worse, since it needed to compile our function. Let's call our function a couple of more times to see if anything changes. Let's copy and paste the output into our text file. This run was actually a little slower. The compilation time went away and the memory allocation remained the same, but more time was spent collecting garbage. Let's call our function one last time to see what happens. Again, let's copy and paste the output into our text file. This third run was even slower, since it spent even more time collecting garbage. But even at this relatively slow speed, it still orders a magnitude faster than writing naive code. So this is one of the performance tips when trying to write fast code. Whenever you can, place your code inside of a function. But this isn't the end of the road. Placing your code inside of a function is just the beginning of our journey. Let's take a look at another iteration to see if we can get Axby to run even faster. 
So the code that we used in our first two iterations was a low-level approach to coding, where we define how to multiply a scalar to a vector, and then define how to add a vector to another vector. But it turns out that Julia already knows how to do that. So there's no need to teach Julia something that it already knows how to do. For this next iteration, let's close out of our Julia session and create another new file. Like before, we're going to use these same variables for n, a, x, and y. So you can just copy and paste the definitions for those variables from the previous file. Let's take a look at the Julia method for a times x. As you can see, Julia already has a method set up to multiply a number with an abstract array. Note that we did not have to use the linear algebra standard library. This method is part of Julia base. Now let's take a look at the method for x plus y. Again, Julia already has a method set up to add an array to another array. And thanks to Julia's multiple dispatch, there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. We can simply use the multiplication and addition operators provided by Julia. Let's do that and time how long that takes. Let's copy and paste the output from the at time macro and paste it into our text file. Wow, that's another big improvement in speed. We're down to less than one second. The number of memory allocations has dropped from 100 million to roughly 430,000. And the size of those allocations has dropped from roughly 2.5 gigabytes to 1.5 gigabytes. The garbage collection percentage is down as well. But the compilation time is up since we need to compile those methods for multiplication and addition. Let's run our code a couple more times to see what happens. Copy and paste the output to the text file. And let's run the code one last time. Let's copy and paste the output and then talk about these results. Okay, so we're down to roughly 0 0.3 seconds with only four memory allocations. There's also no garbage collection in that last run. So you can see the impact of garbage collection between the second run and the third run. That's pretty amazing, right? Just by using Julia's built-in methods, we've improved our performance versus the naive code by more than 100 times. So this is the next lesson when trying to optimize your code. Don't reinvent the wheel. The Julia developers have spent a lot of time optimizing their code, so take advantage of Julia's built-in methods and functions whenever possible. But wait, there's more. Julia's performance tips suggest the use of broadcasting to improve performance. This may seem counterintuitive, since broadcasting means performing operations element by element, which sounds less efficient but let's give it a try to see what happens. Let's close out of our Julia session and create another new file. For the most part, the code for this iteration is the same as the code for the last iteration. The only difference is that we're going to add a dot before the operators. Okay, let's copy and paste the output into our text file.
Now let's run the code a couple more times and copy and paste the results after each run. So broadcasting is indeed faster. If you look at that last run, there are six memory allocations compared to the four in the previous iteration without broadcasting. But even though there are more allocations, those six allocations take up less memory. So this is the next lesson. Try the suggestions from the performance tips section in the Julia documentation, even if they sound counterintuitive. The only way to find out if a tip will help your code is to experiment by trying it out and by timing it. You may be pleasantly surprised by the result. But wait, there's more. If you're on a 64-bit computer like I am, then all of the iterations that we've seen so far have been using 64-bit numbers. In some cases, you can squeeze out more performance by using 32-bit numbers. Let's try that next. Let's close out of our Julia session and create another new file. For this iteration, we're going to use the same broadcasting equations for AXB, but we're going to use 32-bit numbers for all of our variables. Now, because we're using 32-bit numbers, the set of random numbers generated will be different than the set of random numbers that we used in the 64-bit iterations. Okay, now the rest of the code is the same as the previous iteration. Same drill. Let's copy and paste the output into our text file. Let's run this a couple of more times. So using 32-bit numbers is indeed faster. In fact, it's twice as fast. There are the same number of memory allocations as before, but since we're using 32-bit numbers instead of 64-bit numbers, the memory allocation is half the size. In that last run, we're down to less than 0.1 seconds. But this speed comes at a price. 32-bit numbers are less precise and 64-bit numbers. So you should only consider doing this if you don't require the higher precision. So this is the next lesson. Try to use the smallest data type for your numbers. But before you do that, make sure that the loss in precision is acceptable for your application. We have one more iteration to look at. It turns out that the AXP calculation is so common that the Linear Algebra Standard Library comes included with an AXP function. Let's take a look at that function to see if it's any faster. Let's close out of our Julia session and create another new file. For this iteration, all of the variables are the same as the ones that we used in the last iteration. So you can just copy and paste those variable definitions. You can access the axbbang function from the Linear Algebra Standard Library. The axbbang function takes the arguments a, x, and y. The exclamation mark indicates that this is a mutating function. That's because the function overwrites the values in the vector y with the results of a times x plus y for each element, and then returns the updated y vector. Rather than allocating memory for a new vector z to store the results of the axb calculation, you can save memory simply by overwriting an existing vector. That savings in memory allocation translates to an increase in speed. 
As before, let's copy the output from the at time macro and paste it into our text file. One of the disadvantages of using this xbbank function is that it overwrites the values of the vector y. So if you want to reproduce the results using the same random numbers, you need to use the random seed again and then reassign the values for the vectors x and y. Okay, as you can see, this xbbank function is amazingly fast. It's literally more than 1,000 times faster than the naive code that we started with. When you think about it, the naive code is pretty bad. You don't realize just how bad your code might be until you go through this process of fine-tuning the performance of your code. But notice that the last two iterations gain speed by trading off some features. For example, downgrading to 32-bit numbers increased speed, but we lost some precision. And using a mutating function increased speed, but we lost the original values of the vector y. If you need those original values for a future calculation, then using a mutating function might not be the best choice for you. So after going through this process of iterating through your code to gain speed, you may conclude that the loss of some features may not be worth the increase in speed. So you may decide to go back a few iterations. Using broadcasting with 64-bit numbers seems like a good balance. This iteration gives you some good speed while being precise and maintaining your data. What you decide to do is ultimately your choice based on the requirements for your application. And you're able to reach this decision simply by iterating through your code and by using the at time macro. But using the at time macro is just one of the tools that comes included in the Julia toolkit. Another tool is the profiler. Let's take a look at that next. Conceptually, profiling watches your code as it's being run by your computer. Along the way, the profiler takes snapshots to see what your computer is working on at that moment. After your code is done running, the profiler creates a report containing all of these snapshots. You can view this report either in text form or graphically. Unlike the at time macro, which gives you a high level overall view of your code's performance, the profiler gives you a more detailed look at where your computer is spending its time as it's running your code. The profiler also gives you a more detailed look at the memory allocation so you can better understand what part of your code requires the most memory. Let's take a look at a demonstration. Close out of the Julia session and close any open files. Create a new file for this demo. The code that I'm using comes from the Julia documentation on profiling. This function does two things. One, it generates a three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers. And two, it searches that tensor to find the maximum value. Like we did with the XB iterations, let's call this function three times using the at time macro. The first call will compile both the at time macro as well as the function. Okay, we are now ready to run our function through the profiler. Before you run the code through the profiler, ask yourself, what takes longer? Generating a three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers? or searching through all of that data to identify the maximum value. Hmm. Using the at time macro will not answer this question, but using a profiler will. 
Profile is a standard library in Julia, and using the add profile macro is how you run functions through the profiler. When using the add profile macro, the only output is whatever value is returned by your function. In order to see the profile report, you need to use the profile.print function. The output is quite large, so rather than running it from the editor, let's maximize the REPL and call it directly from the REPL. If this is your first time seeing a profile report, it can be daunting. There are a lot of lines of text, but there are only a couple of items in this report worth noting. First of all, the total snapshots is the total number of samples that the profiler took while watching your code in action. If you scroll up to the very top, most of those lines pertain to VS Code. The line that you're looking for is the last line that contains the total number of snapshots. That line should contain the eval call to evaluate your code. Immediately below the evaluation line is the first task in the function. The first task in the function is to generate a three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers. The number to the left of the line indicates the number of snapshots that the profiler took for that task. All of those lines below it and indented to the right are related to that task. If you scroll down a little further, where it indents back to the left, you'll see task number two. Task number two is to identify the maximum value in that tensor. That number to the left of that line is the number of snapshots that the profiler took for that task. If you compare that number to the number for task number one, that will tell you how much time was spent on task number one relative to task number two. So on my computer, generating a three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers took a relatively long time, while finding the maximum value in that tensor was relatively quick. This report is useful, but it may take some getting used to. If you prefer, you can generate a visual representation of it in VS Code. The instructions for how to do this are not included in the Julia documentation. Instead, the source of these instructions is a JuliaCon 2022 demonstration presented by David Antoff and Sebastian Fitzner. A link to their video is in the description below. You can display a visual representation of the profile report by using the add prof view macro from inside of VS Code. This visual representation is also known as a flame graph. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the entire flame graph. I know you can't read the text, but to give you an overview, the way you read this flame graph is to start at the top and work your way down. Just like in the text output, you're looking for the eval line. The two tasks in your function should be immediately below the evaluation line. I'm going to zoom in so we can see those two tasks. So task number one is on the left, and task number two is on the right. Task number one is to generate a three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers. And task number two is to find the maximum value in that tensor. As you can see, task number one took the majority of the time. This is the same information as the text output, but this visual output may be a little more intuitive since all you need to do is look at the size of the boxes to get a feel for what's going on. So this flame graph is for the time. You can also generate a flame graph for the memory allocations by using the profile view allocations macro. When using this macro, you need to include a sample rate. Again, I'm going to zoom out so we can see the entire flame graph. With this flame graph, 
you're just looking for the elements highlighted in a dark yellowish color. So there are only two memory allocations for this function. The first memory allocation is for the three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers. And the second memory allocation is for the maximum value in that tensor. You can change the view from count to size by using the drop-down menu. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see that there's only one line, which is for 100% of the memory allocation. 100% of the memory size allocation is for the three-dimensional tensor filled with random numbers. There's no memory size allocation for the maximum value, since that value is already stored somewhere inside of that three-dimensional tensor. Interesting, right? Now, if you dig a little deeper, you'll notice that the numbers in the VS Code profiler don't match up exactly to the numbers in the text report. Nor do those numbers match up exactly to the overall numbers from the at time macro. That's because the at time macro is showing actual results, while the profiler is merely taking snapshots and providing you with estimated results. So while the profiler is a useful tool, just be aware that it's meant to be a directional tool to help shed some light on relative times and relative memory allocations. We covered a lot of material today, so let's take a few minutes to review what we just learned. So, what are the key takeaways from today? 1. Master the basics. Before you try to write fast code, learn how to write code that works, even if it's slow code. 2. Create functions. Once you're comfortable writing code, wrap your code inside of a function. Creating a function is the starting point for evaluating the performance of your code. 3. Use the at time macro. The at time macro will give you a high level view of the overall time, the memory allocations, the garbage collection time, and the compilation time. These are all important numbers to understand not just the overall time. 4. Use the profiler. The profiler will help you identify potential bottlenecks in your code. Learn how to read both the text report as well as the flame graphs. 5. Use the performance tips. Go through the performance tips section in the Julia documentation to test ideas to see which techniques work for your code. Not every technique will work in every situation, and a technique that works may be counterintuitive. Measure the effectiveness of the techniques by using the at time macro and the profiler. 6. Find a balance. Adding performance tuning to your coding workflow will help you better understand how your computer works and how Julia works, which will ultimately make you a better coder. But the fastest code doesn't necessarily mean the best code. The best code is the code that strikes the right balance between features and performance that works best for your application. And seven, have fun. Call me. If you made it this far, congratulations. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, then please consider smashing that like button, leaving a comment, sharing this video, and subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support the educational work that I'm doing, then please consider using the Super Thanks button. For ongoing support, please consider joining and becoming a channel member. Channel members get ad-free early access to all of my new videos. Thanks for watching, and good luck! on your Julia journey.